Today, we're delving into a topic that might just change the game for you, something no one will ever teach you. Now, let's talk about the incredible powerhouse you have within you, your brain. It's like a magical mirror reflecting everything you've learned and experienced in your life. Your brain is a snapshot of your external environment, an artifact of all the knowledge and moments that have shaped you, feelings and emotions. They're the end product of your past experiences. If you find yourself feeling the same way day in and day out, it's a sign. Two things, actually. First, nothing new is happening in your life. And second, if your emotions are driving your thoughts and those thoughts are creating the same emotions, you're essentially thinking in the past. Now here's the kicker. If you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, and trust me, they do. Continuing to think in line with your familiar emotions means you're reaffirming the same old experiences in your life. It's like hitting repeat on your past. Our research over the last three years has shown without a doubt that when students of our work combine a clear intention with their thoughts, magic happens. Intention is like having a vision, tapping into a potential that already exists in the quantum field, a field of endless possibilities. So what does this mean for you? When you ask yourself creative questions like, what would it be like to be healthy, wealthy, free, in love, something extraordinary happens, your frontal lobe, the crowning achievement of being human, kicks into action. It's like the conductor of a symphony, selecting different networks of neurons connected to your life experiences and seamlessly piecing them together. The result, an ideal, a vision, an internal representation of a potential experience waiting for you. But here's the catch. It's not enough to just have your mind involved. Thoughts, my friend, are the language of the brain, and feelings are the language of the body. When you combine a clear intention with an elevated emotion, be it freedom, joy, inspiration, or genuine love, something extraordinary happens. Your body, the unconscious mind, starts to believe it's living in that future reality right now. You're not just thinking about it, you're embodying it. And when you emotionally embrace that future reality before it physically manifests, you're stepping into a new state of being. It's like you're trying on a new personality. And guess what? A new personality creates a new personal reality. This is where the magic unfolds. Our research has shown that as people regulate their internal states, creating coherence in their brain and generating elevated emotions, not only does the brain become coherent, but so does the heart. It's a beautiful dance. When the brain is coherent, the heart follows suit and vice versa. Now you might wonder, if this is so powerful, why aren't we living like this every day? Well, my friend, that's because 70% of the time we're operating from a state of stress. Living in stress is living in survival mode. When you're in survival mode, you're governed by the chemicals of stress and you define your reality solely by what you can see, hear, and touch. The outer world appears more real than your inner world, leading to a sense of separation from possibility. Why does this happen? Because in survival mode, your body is designed to respond to threats by focusing on external factors. It's not a time to go within, trust the unknown, open your heart, or create. It's a time to survive. So, in order for you to create, you have to lay down the very survival instincts you've relied on your entire life. You have to trade them for something greater to occur. But here's the key. You need to recognize when you're in the creative state and when you're not. Imagine taking some time every day to apply principles that change your beliefs and perceptions about yourself and your life. After all, a belief is just a thought you keep thinking over and over again, rooted in past experiences. Changing these beliefs requires a decision with firm intention, a decision carrying more energy than the hardwired programs in your brain and the emotional conditioning in your body. Your body literally has to respond to a new mind, and that choice becomes an experience you never forget. This is the moment the past biologically no longer exists in you. It's a shift, 
a paradigm change that reshapes the way you perceive yourself and your life. Now let's talk about a word we often throw around, victim. If someone asks you how you're doing and you respond with the things that upset you, a person, circumstance, or condition, here's the deal. You're unconsciously saying that something external is controlling your thoughts and feelings, making you a victim to whatever that is. The challenge here is that when things go well, you feel good. But when things go south, your mood takes a hit. The danger lies in becoming unconsciously reliant on external factors to change how you feel. If you don't realize that you're creating your reality all the time and living in lack, unworthiness, and separation, you'll spend your life waiting for events to fill the emptiness. So, let's turn the ship around. Is it possible that the way you think and feel can have a profound effect on your outer world? This isn't a one-time revelation. It's a journey of gaining knowledge, practice, and experience. Once you start witnessing synchronicities, coincidences, and opportunities falling into place because you're making changes inside of you, you'll start paying attention. When you correlate the changes in your inner world with the effects in your outer world, you begin to understand that your thoughts and feelings shape your reality. This realization shifts your belief from being a victim to being the creator of your life. Let's dive deeper into the concept of breaking the cycle of repetition and how self-regulation plays a pivotal role in transforming your life. Imagine your thoughts and feelings as architects, shaping the reality you experience in the outer world. If you find yourself reacting to the same people, places, and circumstances, it's like watching a never-ending replay of the same story. This repetition keeps you stuck in a loop, reliving the same experiences over and over. To break free from this cycle, you must become greater than your environment. Being greater isn't about physical strength or external dominance. It's about how you think and feel. It's an internal shift that empowers you to change your reality from within. As you begin practicing this transformative mindset, something remarkable happens. You no longer surrender your power to external factors. When faced with a problem or challenging condition, the strength of the emotion you feel alters your inner state. You become more attuned to the external cause, fixating on it as the source of your distress. However, it's crucial to understand that where you place your attention is where you direct your energy. The key to breaking this cycle lies in self-regulation and embracing the present moment. It involves teaching yourself how to navigate your internal landscape, calming the storm of unconscious programs and conditioned emotions. This, my friends, is the real work, the work that empowers you to take charge of your own destiny. Imagine your emotions as a volume knob. The louder they are, the more they dominate your awareness, leaving little room for anything else. Now think about turning that emotional volume down. By lowering the intensity of your emotions, you reclaim your power, enabling you to build your own electromagnetic field. So here's the secret they won't teach you anywhere else. Your thoughts and feelings are the architects of your reality. Recognize when you're in survival mode and make the conscious choice to shift into creation mode. Break free from the cycle of repetition and watch as money and, and so much more comes flowing into your life faster than you ever dreamed possible. You're not just a victim of your circumstances. You're the powerful creator of your destiny. Embrace it, practice it, and watch your life transform in ways you never thought imaginable. So then, is it possible then that that person in the same brain circuitry, in the same emotions of the past, are viewing their life through the lens of the past and they're not seeing things how they are, they're actually perceiving and seeing things how they are, and they're telling a story in their mind that's actually causing them to perceive life equal to that story? Are you with me still? So then you ask that person, so why are you this way? And they'd say, I'm so glad you asked because I get to talk about my past. And as they talk about the incidents in their past, would you agree then that they're saying, that was the event that changed me and I haven't actually been able to change since that event. That event has defined me as the person I am today, yes or no. 
Now, the research on memory says after a period of time, that story that they tell of their past, 50% of it isn't even the truth. So they're making stuff up. They are reliving a miserable life they never even had just to reaffirm, to recreate the emotions, to excuse themselves from changing. So then most people then, they may say with the 5% of their conscious mind, I want a new life, I want a new relationship, I want a new career, or I am healthy. But if 95% of who they are is subconsciously programmed into the past, then that thought of their health, that thought of their wealth is never going to make it to the body because the body is programmed into the past. How many people understand? So then if you teach a person then how to be defined by a vision of the future instead of the memories of the past, then they would have to really start thinking differently. Would you agree? They would have to start making different choices than the choices that they always make. Yes or no. They're going to have to start doing different things and breaking certain habits. And that's going to be uncomfortable. Yes or no. Because the body is going to say, why are we doing this? It's so much more fun suffering than going out for a walk into joy. I don't know if I believe in joy, I believe in suffering. The body goes back. And so that person would have to stop talking certain ways. They would have to start staying away from certain experiences with certain people. You know what I'm talking about, yes? They would have to examine their emotional state every single day. They'd have to stay conscious of their emotional state because the moment they started feeling suffering, they're just disconnected from the energy of their future. They're back to the energy and the emotions of their past. So then teaching people then how to be defined by a vision of the future every single day means they're going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be unfamiliar. There's going to be some uncertainty and you may not be able to predict the next moment because you're no longer feeling like you. That's the moment you just left the known and you stepped into the unknown. Are you with me still? Now, if the body has been conditioned into the familiar past or the predictable future and the body has become the mind of the past or the predictable future, would you agree? Then the body would say, what are you doing? And the body would say, listen, let's get you thinking like you've been thinking. 90% of the thoughts that we think on a daily basis are the same thoughts as the day before. So if you think that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny and 90% of your thoughts are the same known thoughts that you're always thinking, then your life should stay the same because the same thoughts lead to the same choices. The same choices lead to the same behaviors. The same behaviors create the same experiences. The same experiences produce the same emotions. Those same emotions tend to influence the way we think and our biology, our neurocircuitry, our neurochemistry, our hormones, and even our gene expression is equal to how we think, how we act, and how we feel. And how you think, how you act, and how you feel is called your personality. And your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. If you want to create a new personal reality, a new life, you're going to have to change your personality. And you've got to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and change it. You've got to become aware of your unconscious habits and behaviors, even how you speak. And you have to look at the emotions that you live by every single day and decide, do these emotions belong in my future? So many people try to create a new life as the same person. In order to create a new personal reality, you've got to change your personality. So the principle in neuroscience says that nerve cells that fire together, wire together. Thinking the same way, making the same choices, demonstrating the same actions, creating the same experiences that stamp the same networks of neurons into the same patterns, all for the familiar feeling called you. And you do that for 10 years in a row. Well, you're going to hardwire your brain into a very finite signature because you're firing and wiring that way. And that box in the brain, that becomes our personality, becomes our identity. And by the time we're 35 years old, for the most part, we've done something so many times that the body now knows how to do it as well as the mind. 
and that's a habit. So we have these unconscious programs of behaviors, automatic habits, redundant emotional reactions, hardwired beliefs, perceptions, attitudes that function just like a computer program. You press go and it runs automatically. When it comes time to change, thinking positively is going to do nothing because your body has been conditioned for the most part into a program in the past. Thought never makes it to the body because the body's on a different program. How do we begin to influence the body so that the thought actually produces some type of change? Think about it. If you think an unhappy thought, you're going to feel unhappy. If you think you're a failure, you're going to feel like a failure. Once you feel like a failure, you're going to think you're a failure. And people get caught in these loops of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking. And that redundancy is a conditioning process because all you need is an image or a picture or a thought and a feeling and a response, stimulus response. And so people tend to condition their brain and body into the past. When it comes time to change, you've got to leave that familiar territory. And any choice that you make, if you said, hey, I'm going to eat a better diet, I'm going to wake up early and work out, I'm going to do meditation, the moment you decide to do something differently, get ready because it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. There's going to be some uncertainty. You're not going to be able to predict the next moment. That means you've left your known biology and you're stepping into the unknown. Theoretically, that sounds great. But if the body has been conditioned into a familiar feeling, it's in the known. The moment you take it outside the familiarity, it wants to go back to where it's comfortable. Repeating it over and over again is sustaining or maintaining those connections, and that's called memory. So they memorized what they were doing by physically practicing or personalizing what they learned. Make sense? Standard simple. It took the second group of people, and they said, listen, we want you to play two hours a day for two weeks. We're going to scan your brain before and after, but you know what we're going to do? We're not going to tell you how to play anything. You just come and do whatever you want, play whatever you want. So at the end of two weeks, guess what happened to them? Nothing. You know why? Because they couldn't remember what they had learned the day before, and they couldn't remember what they played the day before, and they had no structure. They got no instruction and no knowledge to be able to apply it to make some steady circuits. It took the third group of people and they said, listen, don't even show up. Don't even create your day. Same thing. Nothing happens. Last group of people, they said, listen, we want you to come two hours a day for two weeks. We're going to show you these one-handed exercises. But instead of you physically playing the piano, we want you to mentally rehearse over and over again those exercises. We know you're going to get tired, so we'll nudge you and we'll keep you awake, but you practice for two hours a day and you keep repeating those. At the end of two weeks, they rescanned their brain and guess what happened? Same area of the brain lit up as if they were actually playing the scales. Now, you know what that means? They grew new circuits in their brain just by thinking about it, just by thinking, just by rehearsing. Now, every time we learn something new, we make new circuits in the brain. If you learn anything new, learning is making a new connection in the brain, new neurological connection. Memory is maintaining or sustaining those connections, keeping them alive. And the only way that we maintain and sustain connections in the brain is by repetition. Repetition allows the neurons to develop a long-term relationship. So these people, every single day, made it the most important thing. They gave up their social engagements. They gave up television. They said, I'm going to rehearse. I'm going to mentally rehearse the greatest ideal of myself every single day. And as long as I keep doing it every day, what's going to happen to those circuits? They're going to light up and become the more sustainable circuits to act as a platform of who they will become in the future. During this process of rehearsal, while they were sitting down rehearsing who they were going to be, just like the piano players rehearsing over and over again, they had long moments where they lost track of time and space. In other words, they became so involved with what they were doing that when they opened their eyes or they lifted up their eye masks or when they turned the lights on in the room, it was two hours later and it only seemed like five minutes. 
They were so involved with what they were doing that they lost the feedback of the body, they lost the feedback from the environment, and they lost track of time. And the moment that that happens, geniuses, that's the moment we walk through the door to the quantum field. And that is the moment, by the way, according to neuroscience, that we repattern and rewire the brain. And by the way, guess what part of the brain is the most active when we do that? The frontal lobe, because isn't it true that we're making thought more real than anything else in that moment? And because the frontal lobe is the orchestra leda, it has its connections to the rest of the brain. And what it does is it quiets down the association centers, the thinking centers. It quiets down the motor centers. You don't want to move. You could still. It quiets down the emotional centers. And the only thing that's real is the thought. And when we capture that thought in the frontal lobe, when the frontal lobe captures it as we hold that thought there, what happens is the rest of the neurons in the brain will pattern and make circuits to capture that thought and reflect it as a footprint of whatever we're focusing on. And when we make new circuits in our brain, by the way, do you think that we'll perceive things that maybe already existed but we never really saw? Do you think that's possible? Do you think that the person who lives practicing being a victim every day gets good at it? Turn that on automatically. Is it natural and second nature? And how will they perceive their world based on how they're wired? So if you made new circuits in your brain, do you think you may process or see things in your reality different because now you're wired to see them? Do you accept that? So if I put up a picture of a Monet on the screen up here, and I said to you, isn't that a beautiful picture of what Monet painted? You guys would all say, oh yeah, that's beautiful. And then I took the picture down and I said, did you guys know anything about Monet? Do you know that he spent 44 years of his life teaching himself how to see things differently? So many people have so many interesting definitions about what they think love is. Some people have it in terms of need. Some people have it in terms of sexuality. Some people have it in terms of control and dominance and success. And those are different experiences that really don't lead to this concept called love. And so my theory in a relationship, I was in Australia for three weeks and I was on all these television shows and all these radio shows. And by the end of this tour, I was at the establishment hotel in Sydney and I was sitting with a CNN reporter, an attractive woman. And she said, how come I can't create the relationship that I want? And I said, let me ask you a question. Would you go out with you? Which is really the fundamental question. So I have a couple of theories about relationships that I think are really important. First of all, I will never work in a relationship, and I don't think anybody should work in a relationship. I think if you're working in a relationship, something is not clicking, something is not right. But if you bring your best, and the person that you're with brings their best, and you celebrate your life together, then there's constructive interference, there's growth, there's energy. If you're not at your best and you show up, more than likely you're going to pick someone or something apart. And it's better that you remove yourself for a period of time and get back into your heart and present yourself at your best. And so if you're not there and you need a mirror or a reflection, then it's good to ask, am I missing something? Am I not seeing myself in some way? And then there's a healthy conversation when you invite it. But if you're not invited to contribute your opinion, then it's better off that you don't. So people always say, I want a loving relationship, but what they really want is happiness. We do these meditations to create love in our lives, and it could be love in familial relationships with your siblings. It could be with your parents. It could be with your friends. Or it could be with a significant other. If thoughts are the electrical charge in the quantum field and feelings are the magnetic charge in the quantum field and how you think and how you feel broadcasts an electromagnetic signature that influences every single atom in your life. Can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain is literally changed to look like the event has already occurred? The latest research in neuroscience says you can change your brain from living in the past to living in the future. 
And can you fall in love with that vision to such a degree that you come out of your resting state and change guilt or suffering into inspiration and joy and gratitude? To such a degree that your body, as the unconscious mind, does not know the difference between that external event and what you're creating internally, so that your body believes it's living in that future, in the present moment and you begin to signal new genes in new ways to change your body to look like the event has already occurred. The latest research in epigenetics says you can change your body by thought alone. Now reason this with me. If there's physical evidence in your brain and body to look like the event has already occurred, your brain and body are no longer living in the past, they're living in the future. And you will walk right into your vision, something new you wanted to experience. And the moment you started thinking about this experience, the moment you started contemplating this potential reality, you turned on a part of your brain called the frontal lobe, the crowning achievement of the human being. It's 40% of your entire brain. It is the creative center. And it has connections to all other parts of the brain. And the moment you said, what would it be like to be a leader? What would it be like to be successful? What would it be like to have this vision come true? The moment you asked that open-ended question, you turned on this part of the brain because the rest of the brain is just a bunch of automatic programs. And now the frontal lobe, the creative center, wakes up and it has connections to the entire brain. It's the CEO, it's the boss, it's the symphony leader of the brain. And the moment you get creative, the frontal lobe begins to select different networks of neurons that are stored in your brain from things you've learned or experienced. And as you begin to think a what-if question, it begins to select these different networks and begins to seamlessly piece them together and making your brain fire in new sequences and in new patterns and new combinations combinations, and whenever you make your brain work differently, you're changing your mind. Because mind is the brain in action. Mind is the brain at work. And the moment those neurons fire in tandem, you get a picture in your mind, a hologram, a vision. For those people who are passionate, that thought that they're thinking begins to create an elevated emotion. They become inspired. They feel enthusiastic. They become passionate. They started to open their hearts and all of a sudden, they're combining a clear intention with an elevated emotion. And it's the combination of a clear intention and an elevated emotion in our research over and over again that proves then the person now is changing fundamentally, changing biologically, changing internally. And their brain and body are moving from living in the past into living in the future. When you do that, when you had that moment, you came out of your resting state and then you started to write down all the things you were going to do to get to that vision, all the choices you were going to make, all of the experiences or goals you wanted to achieve, and all of the emotions and the joy you would feel. And when you were doing that, you were setting your sights towards that destiny. And then you did something really brilliant. You wrote down the choices you weren't going to make. You became aware of the behaviors you weren't going to demonstrate. You began to review certain experiences you wanted to stay away from. And then you looked at the emotions that would bring you to a lower level. And you began to separate the old self from the new self. And when you begin to do that, and you're observing the old self, it means you're no longer the program. Now you're the consciousness observing the program. And that's when you begin to objectify your subjective self. And so the moment you stop making the same choices that you always make, get ready because it's going to be uncomfortable. And that's the moment you're heading towards the new self. Do you think that you can change the circuits in your brain by thinking about it? So I did this experiment a little ways back. They took these people who never played the piano before and they separated them into four categories. And they said, listen, we're going to scan your brains before you learn this, these, these exercises. And then we're going to scan your brain after. And all you have to do is show up for two hours a day in practice for two weeks. Okay? And just follow the instructions. 